Sometimes you misread the micrometer and you think you've got room for one more roughing pass, and then you realize you don't. Imperial hand flop of resignation. I've just scrapped that part. Amazingly though, I had a second piece of this very special purpose piece of stock in my bin that's already the right length. When does that ever happen? Clearly Metallicor, the god of machining, has blessed me with his steely appendage this day. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. It's a big day on the ML18 die filer kit project today because I'm going to finally start building the mechanism. I'm going to build the file rod and the crankshaft and all the bearings and such that hold it all together. There's some surprisingly cool and tricky operations for what seem like simple parts, so it should be fun. Let's go. Here's where we left our baby elephant. Now let's get some mechanism put into this thing, shall we? I'm going to start with the file rod. This is the drive rod that moves the file in the machine. This is made from a piece of O1 tool steel, so we just have a few simple operations to do to it to prepare it for the machine. I'll start by rough cutting this to length on the bandsaw. I put a clamp on it there when cutting round stock because the bandsaw can grab it and roll it under and catch your fingers. You don't want that to happen. Starting in the lathe then, we've got some features to make here. I'm using shim stock there. It's actually soda can to protect the finished surface there from the chuck jaws. The outer surface of this material is the final surface we want, so we're not going to machine it any further than that. I'm going to start by facing one end here to clean it up, as is tradition. Then I'm going to slow the lathe way down and put a pretty generous chamfer on the end of it here, both because it looks nice and it'll help the mechanism run smoother inside the machine there. You'll see what I mean by that towards the end of this video. The first feature that I need is a hole very, very deep down the center of it here. So I'll start by center drilling that to keep my drill on course. And then I'll get the drill size in here and lots and lots of cutting fluid on there. And away we go. This is one of those interesting features whereby it's just drilling a hole, which would be simple normally, but because of the material and the depth of the hole, this actually becomes quite a bit of an operation. This is tool steel, which is pretty tough drilling, and it's a very, very high aspect ratio hole, meaning it's extremely deep relative to the diameter. In fact, it's going to take pretty much all of this jobber length drill to get the depth that we need. So the method that I'm using here is basically lots and lots of peck drilling. I go a little bit at a time and I pull the drill out, add more cutting fluid, go back in and resume drilling. Because the actual depth doesn't need to be that accurate, I can use this technique wherein I release the tailstock and pull it out to clear chips and add fluid and then push it back in, lock it down and resume cranking the hand wheel. That's much, much faster than cranking it all the way out and cranking it all the way back in again. It's a little bit less accurate because you kind of lose your depth setting a little bit each time you do that, but for a job like this, it doesn't matter. Clearing chips frequently is especially crucial on a very deep hole like this because once those flutes on the drill get packed full of chips, the end of it is going to stop cutting and it's going to start rubbing, which is very bad for the hole and the drill. And also when packed full of chips, the drill is going to tend to wander off course. So on a very deep hole, you're going to end up no longer on the center by the end of it, which is also very bad. This hole is actually part of the lubrication system of the die filer, which is really quite neat. I'll explain that more in a bit. But right now I gotta let the part cool down because it's very hot. Then I can flip it over. You don't want to clamp down on a really hot part because as it cools down it's gonna shrink and the jaws could get loose on the chuck. After flipping it I do a facing cut to clean up that edge and that's so that I can get an accurate measurement of how long the bar currently is. You need both ends faced for this to be accurate. And that tells me how much I need to remove to face the bar down to length. So now we establish the final length of the part by facing off the amount needed this end also gets a hole drilled in it that's not nearly as deep. This is part of the system that holds the end of the file in the machine. That's it for the lathe on this part. Pretty simple, just a couple of deep holes in the ends, a little bit of chamfering, a little bit of facing. Over to the mill now, I'm going to set this up in a collet block. The purpose of this setup is to split one end of the piece here to create kind of a half circle feature at the end using the short hole that was drilled there. This half circle is what holds the round shank on the die filer files. Using the edge finder here, I'll center up on the bar and find the end of it there. The centering on the Y axis isn't actually necessary for this step, but it will be for the next step. So I did it now while I had the edge finder in there. 
Then I touch off with the end mill, zero the quilt DRO there to monitor my depth and proceed to mill down to half the depth of this drill rod in a series of passes. Mostly I was feeding in from the end because that was quickest, but then I had to clean up the edge there with a side milling pass along the Y axis there to make sure that it's a square feature like it's supposed to be. When I think I'm close, I can start measuring. So for that, I'm going to need to deburr this first to make sure that the burrs don't interfere with the measurement, of course. I've got a little needle file in there so I can deburr this without upsetting my setup here. I tried to measure this with the micrometer, but because of the half circle shape of it there, I wasn't able to get the anvils to sit anywhere on it. So I had to use the guessimeters here instead, but that's okay. These will be accurate enough for this dimension. That finishing cut there will bring us down to dimension. Surface finishes on this feature didn't come out great. I didn't have my speeds and feeds quite right for either of my tools there, but eh, it'll be functional at least. Next I need a hole in the side of this thing that connects to the really long hole in the center that we drilled at the other end. For the position, just measuring with a scale is accurate enough here. The only purpose of this hole is that it connects the side of the bar to the center channel there. Now the drawing shows this side hole being clocked 180 degrees from the flat feature we just created. Don't know how important that is, I don't think very, but just in case I'm going to do it. So I flattened that surface out there with an adjustable parallel on the end, and that'll clock the features 180 degrees opposite each other. And now I can drill this out. The idea here is that oil flows up the center channel of this rod and out the sides here. So as long as this hole connects with the center channel, the actual position of it I don't think matters very much. That completes the file rod. I made this first because all the other parts of the mechanism basically depend on this thing, so I want to be able to fit other parts to this as we go along. Speaking of which, I need two bronze bearings for this file rod to run in. I've got this hollow stock here for the purpose. You can buy bronze in hollow form like this explicitly for making bearings. They know you're going to drill it out anyway. Before I start though, I'm measuring the file rod here in a bunch of places to make sure I know exactly what the diameter of it is. This is Tight Tolerance 01 Tool Steel Drill Rod, which means it's plus or minus 5 tenths all the way down on dimension. But I want to know, is it plus or minus, and how much? Because I'm aiming for a very accurate sliding fit here. Into the lathe then with the bronze tube stock. Now, I'm going to do the center first, and you might think, well, there's already a hole there, so I can just drill it out and then ream it, right? No, you cannot do that. This material is what's called continuous cast. The way they make it is there's a crucible into which they pour molten bronze, and at the bottom of the crucible is a water-cooled graphite dye that the material flows through. Kind of like squeezing Play-Doh out through one of those Play-Doh factory machines. It presses the donut shape continuously into a long bar like this. What that means is that that inner surface that looks like a drilled hole is a cast surface which means it's not guaranteed to be concentric. So if you run a drill down that, the drill is going to wander around a little bit, and then the reamer that you put down there is going to do the same thing. And you'll end up with a hole that's probably on dimension, but not going to be concentric. More on that in a moment, but I am going to start by facing off the end of this stock. The end of it there is a very crooked saw cut that came from the manufacturer, so we'll take care of that here with a few facing cuts. So we've got this hole down the middle that is not concentric, but we need to create concentricity from it. How do you create concentricity from a random surface? With a single point cutting tool. And that's what the boring bar is. The boring bar is your single point hole making tool. That is the power of single point cutters, is that they can create concentricity from any surface. So that means we have to bore this out. We can't touch it with a drill or a reamer. Depending on how well made the stock is, you might get away with drilling it and reaming it, but you really shouldn't. You really should just go straight to the boring bar. To monitor my progress, I'm going to measure with gauge pins here because the hole is too small for my bore gauges. So some trial and error with gauge pins lets me know where I am after the initial cleanup cut, and then I can start boring to dimension. It's worth noting that once the boring bar has created the concentricity that you need, you can then come back in with a drill or reamer to finish the hole out. That might be quicker if you have a lot of material to remove, or if you have a reamer that's the exact dimension you need. 
And I make sure to finish with a nice finishing cut here because I do want a nice sliding finish in there. I'll test fit with the file rod here. Not quite there. It wants to start, but it's not quite there yet. So I took another tiny, tiny cut off of there. Give it another try here. And that now looks really good. That's a really nice sliding fit in there. There's zero play in that. If anything, it's just a teeny bit sticky, but that's okay because that'll run in and that's what I want. Now I can turn the OD of this and the dimension that I'm shooting for here is a Loctite fit in the main base casting there. So I'm looking for a sliding fit, but not an interference fit. Generally, this is about a one thou clearance on the hole that the part is gonna go in. The nice thing about Loctite is if you blow this clearance, if you miss the one thou and you end up with a two or three or four thou fit, you can switch to Loctite 680, which is a high viscosity version of 603 and end up with just as good a hole. When I think I'm there, I bring in the casting and just do a test fit there before I take it down off the lathe in case I need to do another cut. And that is just right. I can just barely slide that on there. That's perfect. The Loctite will do the rest. Now it's time to part it off. So I find the edge by sweeping the scale over the end of the part till I feel the parting blade. Move down using the DRO to the correct length, begin the part, break that sharp corner on the back, and then finish the part. And Yahtzee! Let's do a little test fit here on the casting and see how we did. And that slides right in there perfectly. Very, very nice fit. Really happy with that. And then in goes the file rod. Now the bottom has a very similar bushing, and for that one I didn't nail the fit quite this well. It's a little bit oversized, so here's a dirty trick. I just go in there with a master brake cylinder hone. This is an automotive tool that I find many, many uses for in my shop, including fixing little machining boo-boos like this one. This was actually largely down to surface finish. When you're going for a really close tolerance fit, the surface finishes on both parts have to be good or you'll never be able to get a good fit. And recall that that lower bore in the casting was actually done with a drill, so the surface finish in it wasn't great. A little bit of honing there solves the problem though, and now both of those bushings are working really, really well. The good news is I got the alignment really good on them as well, so that file rod is moving through both bushings really, really well. If you don't get this alignment good, the build notes have a good trick here. Just turn the lower bushing under size and then glue it into the hole with JB Weld instead of Loctite with the file rod in place to hold the two bushings in alignment. And once the JB Weld sets, your alignment will now be perfect. That's a good trick. Next up is a little brass cap that goes on the bottom. That lower bushing gets covered by this. So I've got this scrap of brass here. I just parted the end of it off there and then faced and turned this down to dimension. Now I need to hollow the center of it out to make a little cup. For that, I'm gonna bring in my Morse taper end mill holder because I'm gonna start this counter bore with an end mill. This is an easy way to give yourself a nice, reasonably flat bottomed hole to start with when boring. Of course, end mills don't make a perfectly flat bottom. They have an end clearance on them. So you end up with a little bit of a positive cone in the bottom, but most of the time this is close enough to flat. I go into final depth there with the end mill. You notice that I did not use my drill chuck for that. People do put end mills in drill chucks, but you're really not supposed to. Jacob's chuck jaws don't hold an end mill very well because they're too hard and they will tend to slip and it's kind of stressful on the jaws. With the end mill having done most of the work now, it's an easy job to come in with the little boring bar here and finish this out to dimension. I do a couple of passes down the sides and then on my final pass, if the boring bar is small enough for the bore, then I will also pan across the back a very light cut just to face off that little cone left by the end mill. Again, not really essential, but if your boring bar is smaller than the radius of the hole, then you can pan across and finish that up nicely. Dimensionally, everything looking good there. The ID of this part is not super crucial. Mainly it's important that the OD be a nice close sliding fit in the casting there so that it can once again get Loctited in. And in that case, it needs to be oil tight as well, because this cap is holding in the oil in the casting. Now we can part that off. Yahtzee! Now I'm going to mock this up so you can see how it works, because it's actually surprisingly cool. This cap here goes on the bottom under the lower bearing, as you see there, and then the file rod slides up and down in there. But there's more going on than meets the eye. The file rod goes down into this little cup on each stroke, and that cup is acting as a little oil sump. So it's actually forcing oil up into the center of that file rod. So it shoots up into that hole and then out that little side hole that we drilled. 
So the file rod is simultaneously acting as an oil pump and lubricating the rest of the mechanism by splashing oil up into the top of it. Surprisingly clever. I really like this part of the mechanism. I'm going to build the crankshaft next and you can see all the parts laid out here. I'm actually going to build it in reverse from the pin back and I'm going to do it in that order because that's the order in which I can control the fit of each component as I go along. You'll see what I mean here. I'm going to start with the crank pin because it's hardened and thus I have the least control over its final dimension. It starts with annealed O1 drill rod here. This is just faced and chamfered on each end. It's a very, very simple part. The interesting part is that once we've got it to final dimension, that it needs to be hardened. So over to my little hearth here, and I'm going to harden it by heating it up to a glowing reddish orange. And I'm going to hold it here for quite a while. You want to hold it here for several seconds to make sure that it's thoroughly, thoroughly heated through. And then it goes into the oil. It's actually best not to drop it by accident like I did here. You want to move it up and down as you quench it to keep cavitation bubbles on the surface from interfering with the quench. This is oil here that I'm using because this is O1 tool steel. That's an oil hardening steel. The oil that I'm using is canola oil. Nice and non-toxic and makes the shop smell like french fries when you quench things in it. It comes out black and charred from the torch. So next we need to clean the surface up because we need to be able to see the surface cleanly for the next step here, which is tempering the part. Right now it's extremely hard, like glass hard. Harder than anything else in your shop. Harder than all your files, all your taps, everything. That's too hard because it'll be brittle. So we need to temper it. To do that, we heat it up again, but this time gently and slowly because we're heating it up and I'm watching the color of the surface and I'm looking for a light straw color, kind of a brownish yellow. And I'm going a little bit at a time and waiting because when you heat a part like this, it has an inertia. After you take the torch away, it continues getting hotter for a few more seconds. And it's very easy to go too far with this. So I'm being very careful to heat it just a little bit at a time and rolling it around and giving it a few seconds to see the color settle down. And once I'm at a nice even straw brownish yellow color all the way around, then I'm done. So that right there is hardened and tempered. If you go a little too far with the temper, like I did on this practice piece, you get a darker brownish straw color, or you can even get into the purples and blues on the back. These purples and blues are a deeper temper that makes the part more flexible. So for example, the shank on a drill is tempered to that point, whereas things like taps and files are much harder but most of the time you want that straw yellow. With the hardening done, then I take the 320 grit paper to it again to clean up the surface once again, make it nice and shiny and give it a nice smooth bearing surface there. And that's the completed pin right there. Now nice and hard. I leave the ends yellow there just to remind myself that this pin has been hardened. On to the crankshaft disc now. I've got this big chunk of three inch round bar. It's a little oversized, but it's the closest thing I had. I'm going to cut a slug of this off using the big horizontal bandsaw here. This would be much too slow to cut with anything else. This big saw is great for jobs like this. And that is going to make a piece that's manageable for my lathe. I've got the outside jaws on my three jaw here. I can't use the outer steps, unfortunately. The stock's not quite big enough for that, so i got to play dodge the spinning wings of death on these next few operations. Start by facing off the end, as is tradition. And then I'll turn down the OD here to the right diameter. I switched away from the tangential tool here to the carbide insert. I really like that tangential tool. It's great at many, many things, but it is not great at breaking chips. So when I'm doing a lot of long, heavy cuts like this, especially in steel, I do still tend to switch to the carbide. So several roughing passes and a nice finishing cut later, break that sharp edge, and then I got to drill a hole through the center. I'm going straight in with the half inch drill, no pilot drill required here because I'm not worried about the drill wandering off because we're going to be boring to final size anyway. So if we lost any concentricity with that drill, it isn't going to matter anyway. We're going to get it back right here. This is going to be a press fit on the shaft, so I'm aiming for a very specific dimension. I haven't made the shaft yet, but I just want to make sure that where I end up is something that I know exactly what that dimension is, if that makes sense. Next, just to make the part look nice, I thought I would uh, put a nice chamfer on both sides of it here. This part is going to be forever hidden inside the mechanism, but, you know, make it look nice anyway. I decided to try my luck with parting off this large piece here. This is close to the biggest thing I've ever tried to part off, but I kind of felt like I could do it. It was slow going. The lathe doesn't like running as slow as is required for parting a piece this big. 
but I just ran out of clearance right at the end. I misjudged how much I was going to need, so I just went ahead and finished it with the hacksaw. Then I flipped it around, I used some copper shim there to protect the finished surfaces from the jaws, and I set this up to face it down to final thickness and clean up this surface here. Of course, by flipping apart in a three-jaw chuck like this, you lose concentricity, but we're only facing this back surface here, so it doesn't matter. If we were doing something like drilling a hole that needed to be concentric with the outer surface, we would have to now switch to the four-jaw and dial it in before doing anything. To do this facing, I've got a left-hand turning tool in the back of the tool post because that allows me to get in between the spinning wings of death there and face that back nice and square and down to dimension. And I finished up by matching the chamfer I did on the other side over here on this side. And I also put a chamfer on this side of the hub here because that's going to make pressing in the crankshaft easier. Make sure that it guides it in straight there. All right, so we're done with the lathe here for the crankshaft disc. And then I'm going to go over to the mill now and set it up to drill for the crankshaft pin. For this setup, I'm using a tiny little V-block that's just a scrap of aluminum that years ago I cut a V in for setups like this, and I put it in the drawer and I find a lot of uses for it. You always want three points of contact to clamp a round part if you can. Two points is really not enough to hold something securely. And I indicated that in with the dial indicator in the spindle there, and then I center drilled, drilled, and reamed this out for the crank pin. Now, this is why I made the crank pin first, because it's difficult to control the dimension of a hardened piece without a surface grinder, because the hardening process can change the dimension slightly. So now I can drill and ream this hole to fit. That looks like it's going to be a really good light press fit there, but if that was a little too small, I could now go in with an oversized reamer. Or if it was already too big with the onsize reamer, then I could fall back to Loctite. Over now to my little two-ton arbor press to assemble these pieces. Get the pin centered on there and this should press right in. This is somewhere between a half to a one thou interference, so a nice easy press, and that will never go anywhere. That should be nice and secure. It's looking good so far. We've got the hardened pin in our crank web, and next it's on to the crank shaft itself. I won't show you this because it's just another piece of drill rod with the ends chamfered and one end turned down for once again a half to a one thou interference on the crank web. Now on this one, I missed the dimension a little bit. It's a few tenths smaller than I wanted, so the press fit might be a little light. So just in case, I added some Loctite to this guy to make sure that it's a nice, strong interference fit there. That's Loctite 603 once again. That's the press fit Loctite. If you blow the dimension by more and you end up with a slip fit, then Loctite 680 will save your bacon here. That's actually a bit of a stronger interference than I thought it was going to be, so that pressed in very, very nicely. Really happy with that. I'll clean up the excess Loctite there. Anything touching the air won't cure. Loctite needs an anaerobic environment to cure. And that is looking like a crankshaft. And this was the moment where I realized I still have one more feature to do on that crankshaft that I really should have done before assembly. I need to cut a keyway in the far end, and the piece will now no longer fit in a call-up block. It's too short to go far enough through. So I'm going to have to do a funky setup here with a V-block in the vise in order to get enough stick out there on the shaft for this keyway. This is going to be a woodruff key, so this is a woodruff key cutter that we'll be using. These are kind of like tiny, really thick slitting saws, and thick is the operative word there. You can see the cutting edges are quite wide, so this is a very high tool pressure operation, and it's not clear that my little mill is up to it, but we will find out. I'll find the end of my bar there so I know where to position the key slot. Now I need to get this cutter on center, so I'm using a 10 thou feeler gauge on top of the part, and I'm moving down with the head until I feel that gap there is correct. Zero the z-axis there, then I feed down using the head again, and I feed up to the bottom of the stock again using the same feeler gauge. Then I use the half function on the DRO for the z-axis, and that gets me on center then when I crank back up to zero. That automatically compensates for the thickness of the cutter, the material, and the feeler gauge. I use the feeler gauge there so that I don't scratch up the material with the cutter while feeling for the surface. And then I can feed in, touch off with the cutter, and away we go. Machinery's Handbook will tell you how deep to go for your given type of woodruff key. So this is a 404 key that I'm using, so the book says to go to 136 thou of depth here. I'm feeding on the y-axis very slowly. Very slowly being the operative word. This is such an aggressive cutter for this small mill that I'm actually feeding about a thou per second, maybe a little less. That's my feed rate here on the y-axis. Very, very slow. Got to be patient. And the cutter's running about 225 RPM. Experimentally, those speeds and feeds seem to work the best. 
You'll notice I've got two V-blocks holding the part. It's not technically correct for holding round stock. You should have three points of contact, not four. Four is technically over constrained. But a second V-block was the only thing low profile enough to get in under the spindle here to hold this part. So I didn't really have any choice. Well, it looks like a keyway. Let's see if it holds the key. Oh, look at that. That's very satisfying. I gotta say, this being tool steel, that was a difficult cut for this little mill, but we got it done by the skin of our teeth, and that looks really, really excellent. Woodruff keys are actually very satisfying. I think I'm going to use more of them. Well, now the crankshaft is done. Got the keyway in there for the pulley, and all the rest of the features there are all done. This crankshaft, however, also needs a bearing. As you can see, it's rather a bit undersized for the end of the casting. So I've got a long piece of that tubular material again to make this bearing. This one is interesting though because it won't fit through the spindle bore on my lathe, so this simple part is surprisingly tricky. I'll start by machining a band here in the middle with a small grooving tool, and that's to run the steady rest on. I make sure not to go too deep with this band, just deep enough to get a clean up on that rough outer cast surface there, and then I can bring in my steady rest and set it up to run on that band there. Get the wheels snugged up, tighten down the locks on that, get some oil on there, and now we're ready to machine. I'll face off the end, of course, as is tradition, to get that square, and then I'm going to do the inner bore first. Boring out the center here is a fairly straightforward operation, just like the other bearings that we've made. Once again, aiming for a very close, smooth running fit on the crankshaft with no side-to-side -side play here. Let's see how we did. And that is really, really good. That runs in there very nicely. There's no lateral play in that at all, so very happy with that fit. It's worth taking your time on these moments because that's going to dictate a lot about how well the machine runs. Now I can remove the steady rest and bring in my largest live center, and that's going to run in that bore and support the end of the part so we can turn the OD. So hopefully that order of operations decision there makes sense. This was a way for me to get this done with the steady rest. The first cut was not as deep as my steady band, but now in this final cut we find out if my steady band was too deep or not, and the answer is... No, it was not. That's a relief. It's not really, though. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if there was a little bit of a groove left in the middle of this bushing at the end. And then I can part this off to length. Design-wise, honestly, this doesn't need to be one giant bushing. This could have easily been two bushings at either end of the crankshaft. I don't know why the designer did it this way, but... Eh, here we are, one giant bushing. Once again, that's a very close sliding fit in there, and that's going to get Loctited in place. Let's test fit the crankshaft here and see how that's going to go together. So the crankshaft slides in there from the inside, and oh, that spins really, really nicely. Wow, I'm very pleased with that. Not to toot my own horn too much, but that runs really beautifully. I'm very pleased with that. Gotta love machining. There's a view from the inside. You can see how that crankshaft is going to spinny spin in there. The web is so large there because it's also a support surface for the Scotch yoke drive system. So this will all make sense in future videos. Fun fact on this bushing, it's actually overly long on the inside. It sticks through the back of the casting because it also acts as a thrust surface for the back of the crankshaft. Well, there she is so far. We finally got some pieces of the mechanism there. We've got crankshafts and file rods and bearings and stuff moving. It's starting to look like a machine, finally. I think this is really good progress so far. We're going to finish up the drive mechanism next time, hopefully, the scotch yoke that causes the file rod to move up and down with the crankshaft. But that's all the time I have for you this week. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.